Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of Cloud Tool Time. Cloud Tool Time is brought to you by the Eclipse Cloud DevTools uh, Working Group. My name is Brian King. I'm the community manager for the Z Working Group. Um, working Group's mission is to define and promote best in class tools uh, in and for the cloud. Um, and some of these tools, uh, I'm delighted that our speaker today, uh, Maximilian Kegel from Eclipse Source, will be talking about. Um, uh, this is his second tool time, I believe. So uh, welcome back. And I know you, our audience, are probably quite diverse. Maybe some of you are used to working with traditional Eclipse tools, such as the Eclipse IDE. Maybe some of you are already using our, our cloud tools, um, such as Eclipse Thea and Eclipse J. Uh, maybe some of you are using uh, tools from other ecosystems, or maybe it's just a mix of all this. So, you know, I'm sure you have a, a lot of questions, uh, and Maximilian is going to answer some of those questions today. Um, include questions like which frame frameworks and what technologies are available and how can they support a cloud-based tool project? How can these technologies be combined and integrated into a consistent tool chain? And how can legacy desktop tool components be reused or migrated into a cloud context? Um, so after that long-winded introduction, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Maximilian. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me. Welcome everyone to this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to post them to the chat. We'll reserve a couple of minutes in the end to ask those questions. And of course, you can just contact me after the presentation at any time if you have more questions. So web-based tools built with Eclipse. Um, let's dive right into it, but maybe first a question. Why would you even bother to build web-based modeling tools, right? If you are familiar with the Eclipse ecosystem, there is a lot of existing platforms and frameworks to build desktop-based tools. And uh, there have been decades of, um, of effort being poured into creating those. So why web-based tools and why now? Well, first of all, you by using web-based technology, you can leverage a cloud-based environment. So suddenly there's no more client installation, especially for people that don't use your tools a lot. This is a huge advantage. They can just access the tool and the resources within the tool through a web link. So for example, if someone is reviewing something, that's really convenient for them. Client updates are simple. Uh, basically, people just open their browser and whenever they reload or come back again, they have the new version of that. And last but not least, um, there's also an advantage that for some tools is really important, which is physical resource sharing. So sometimes you might have a tool that requires some unique physical resources, like a lot of CPU power, maybe a lot of RAM to be able to run certain analysis or simulation features in your tool. Now, not everyone uh, might have those on their local computer. And with a cloud-based environment, you can just leverage those from the cloud-based environment. Other scenarios where there's physical resource sharing is, for example, development boards or other unique hardware that you need to, for example, deploy and test on. You can, for example, use them via web USB. And therefore, not everyone needs to have that hardware. They can just share it. Furthermore, usability. So you get a modern UI a look and feel in a web browser. You can use modern technology like HTML5 in comparison to maybe SWT within an RCP application or SVG instead of GEF uh, in the Eclipse context. And finally, maintainability. I mean, if you build such tools, many of those tools are working for several years, if not decades. So you need to think about the long-term evolution of those. And you also need to think about how can I find people that build and maintain those tools and hiring. And I think there's also an edge to web-based tooling in maintainability these days. So if you actually go to decide to implement your next tool in with web-based technology, or if you decide to migrate an existing tool to web-based modeling tools. And if you would have asked me 
like five years ago, I would probably have told you, well, you can do that, but it's going to be a lot more expensive for the same features. Probably I would have told you maybe even an order of magnitude more expensive. But that has definitely changed. And that's due to a number of key enabling technologies that have been created and that have reached a certain maturity now that brings down that number significantly if it doesn't even move um, the effort for a web-based tool in comparison to a desktop-based tool on the same level. So first and foremost, this is Eclipse Thea. Um, it's an extensible cloud IDE. You can think of it as uh, the Eclipse RCP, but for web-based tools. Then secondly, if you are thinking about creating modeling tools rather than pure tools with only textual content, uh, emf.cloud, which um, provides you with something similar than emf, but for the web. Then Eclipse GLSP, which is about web-based diagramming. Diagrams and graphs are often things that you find in those tools. And finally, Eclipse Shea and also Kubernetes, which is about deploying those tools into the cloud. I'm going to get into more detail on those different technologies throughout the talk, but those are key enablers that really made it a lot cheaper over time to create those kinds of tools. Now, what tool am I even talking about? Um, because tool is a very, very broad term. So uh, I'm going to just show you a prototypical tool with features that I often see in the tools that we build for customers. And many of those tools have something like a workbench. So a workbench provides you with windowing so that you can position views and editors and rearrange them. It provides you with a status bar so that you can show status and maybe errors in compilation or progress. It provides you with menu. It provides you often with a concept similar to perspectives where you can switch between different activities like debugging or exploring code. All that makes up the workbench. And most importantly, it also provides you with the concept of a workspace so that you can have a um, file system that you view in an explorer-like view that you actually work on and where you open your editors from. Secondly, in many of those tools, you have form-based data entry or viewing. Many times this is combined with a tree. So you have a tree where you select something from one of your configuration files, models, whatnot. And when you select something in the tree, then you get a form where you can enter the details for that particular element. Then, as I already mentioned, often you also have diagrams. Some of the data, especially interconnected data, is better visualized, visualized and also better edited often in a diagrammatic way. So diagram editors are very frequent in those kinds of tools. And of course, text. I mean, why not? Many of those tools edit text. Um, text that is a DSL, maybe, for a very specific purpose, or text that is just a general purpose programming language, like Java, that you need to edit in those tools. Or configuration files, like uh, JSON or XML files. Then, often enough, once you've entered data into the tool, you want to do something with that data. You want to analyze it, or you want to run a simulation. So you need to be able to create views for that. And finally, often you also generate other artifacts from the data that you've entered into the tool with generators. So that could be documentation, other resulting configuration files that you can then use in production, or it could be source code, which is also the case very often. Now, along the presentation, I'm going to use one example product, the coffee editor. The purpose of that is a demo tool to model coffee makers. And the example was just chosen because hopefully everyone can relate to that. And within that demo tool, there's a couple of features. I'm always going to show the feature first, how it looks like in the actual tool. And then I'm going to explain how the feature was implemented with which frameworks and which architecture to implement that feature. The features are a tree editor for structuring, structural modeling with forms, a graphical editor for 
diagram editing. And then a model server component, uh, which doesn't show a UI, but it shows how the different editors are integrated so that they can work on the same data at the same time, always reflecting the same state of the data. So if you think in the graphical editor, there could be a node that also shows in the tree editor, you need to take care of somehow synchronizing the editors. Then I'm going to show code generation. Then we are we'll work with the generated source code. So we will edit Java and C code, and then we will also debug that code. Then we will also show a textual editor for textual modeling, so a textual DSL. And finally, model analysis. So we are going to create some analysis and run that on the um, data that we've created within the tool. This coffee editor is part of the emf.cloud project. So you can also try that on your own. Um, you can go either to the GitHub project and then build a Docker container from that and run it. Or you can also just right now try it on your own if you go to the URL here. So that's eclipsesource.com slash coffee minus editor. That's a live version of the editor that uh, should reflect exactly what I'm showing here. Now to the remainder of the talk, uh, when I present how things have been implemented, I'm going to use these kinds of diagrams or visualizations. And um, I'm just going to introduce them here for the feature of code generation. If we think about this tool, which is based on Eclipse Thea, as mentioned earlier, Eclipse Thea has the following architecture. You run Eclipse Thea, at least in one of the two deployment ways, in the browser. So you have some JavaScript TypeScript code that makes up the Eclipse Thea front end. So that provides you with this aforementioned workbench, windowing, menus, and the like. And that runs in the browser. And then in the back end, we have a Node.js server running, which runs the Thea backend. So that, for example, provides you with auto-completion suggestions for code editors and features like that. And of course, Thea is a platform, so you can extend it. So for both front end and the back end, you can contribute extensions. And that's what we're going to do a lot to add the features to a vanilla Eclipse Thea over time. So there's a front-end extension. Mainly, this is concerned with contributing things to the UI, like additional menu entries, register file associations when certain files open. And we have back-end extensions that can, for example, run additional servers for, for example, parsing Java code to be able to provide um, autocomplete suggestions. In these diagrams, I'm always going to highlight the components in green that are pre-existing that you don't have to create yourself, and in yellow, the components that make up the functionality that we create and that you have to program yourself or that we had to create in order to create this coffee editor. So that should make clear where you have to invest some effort. Now, for this example of code generation, um, the idea of code generation is that you have some model file that describes what kind of code you would like to generate. So in our example, we're going to generate the different a class for each activity that the coffee maker runs through, like brew, preheat, expense the coffee, drink the coffee. And um, this code generator could be now either a component that you create from scratch, or if you're in a migration use case, you might already have that code generator because it was something that was integrated, for example, in your RCP application. So the first thing that we have here is just the code generator as you have it, in case you already have one. Otherwise, you would need to create them. And then this code generator usually, and that's now indicated with this yellow frame, needs a little bit of glue code. In the example that I'm going to show later on, the code generator will just need a CLI so that I can launch the code generator as an external process and pass it parameters. Namely, the code generator needs to know where to generate to. So it needs to know a workspace URL. And secondly, it needs to know what file to consume. So what's the model file as an input? And then it can run. So usually, if you reuse a code generator, you need this glue code, a couple of lines of code, a main method in a Java class. 
And then you need a backend extension for Eclipse here, a generator launcher. The generator launcher would be responsible to launch this external process of generating the code. So it would be responsible to find out where the workspace is, the current workspace. You can just ask the Eclipse CI backend for that. And it is responsible for passing in the current model file so that the code generator knows what to do. And then it would spawn this process, um, maybe progress monitor the process or not. And then at some point, the code is generated. And the missing link now is somehow the user needs to be able to trigger that. So for the example that I'm going to show later, the user can right-click the model file and select from the context menu an action generate code. So that needs to be contributed to the Thea front end. And that's what the generator UI does. And uh, it then triggers the generator launcher by telling it, OK, which file was this action launched on? So into the demo, uh, the first thing that I wanted to show is uh, form-based editing. I have a demo prepared here, and I would like to now launch that. Uh, as I told you earlier, there's a Docker image available. Um, you can create that if you go to the GitHub repo and build a Docker image, and then you can run the Docker image. That's what I'm going to do now. The Docker image contains everything that makes up the tool. So it launches the Thea backend, and it launches all the backend extensions that I've talked about and that make up the functionality that we have here. It's already launched now. And I go to localhost. And this is now the Thea front end launching. And here we go. So this is what I've promised with Thea will offer you. So you have this workbench here. We have a menu here. We have the different perspectives here. So for example, I have a perspective to explore code, to search for something, to go into source control, or to debug. In the menus, there's all the actions. And I have a status bar below here. And also, I have different views for problems in my code and consoles that I can use. Now I can just open up the form-based editor. I have a .coffee file here. This constitutes the configuration of the coffee machine. It consists, it's called Super Brewer 3000. It consists of a brewing unit with a control unit. And if I select something here, I get a form-based input on the right-hand side where I can enter the different values for different properties of that control unit. Also, more complicated stuff here, maybe. No. So this is a quite typical form-based editor. How did we create that? So for the involved components, we have a tree that we saw where we can select things. We used a tree component from the emf.cloud project. I'm going to go a little bit into detail what the emf.cloud project is later on also. This tree component makes it quite simple to build a tree. And then for the forms, we've used a framework called JSON forms. Um, maybe this is also a good pointer. I will share the slides later, so you can also follow up the links on the slides. And JSON forms is a framework, just in a nutshell, that doesn't force you to program those forms programmatically, but declaratively. So you need to provide it with a JSON schema that describes the data that you want to display in the form and a UI schema that describes how the data is mapped into a form. For, the, for this example that we have just seen, some of the forms we have manually edited the UI schema so it looks better and has maybe a two-column layout. For others, we have just generated the UI schema. So this is often a good way to start because you get a form essentially for free and then later on you can spend time on designing the forms in a more usable way. The framework is highly extensible, so you can basically support a lot of different technology. You can have your own custom renderers for different types of control tables and whatnot. And it's also multi-platform. For this context, we've used a React-based renderer, but there's also renderers that create those forms for Angular or Vue.js or even in a mobile setting. And there's a bunch of vanilla renderers also that uh, don't rely on the particular UI framework. If we look at that from an uh, architectural perspective, we have in the, run, in the browser running the Thea front end, 
And for the front end, we've contributed the coffee tree editor component. This is responsible for telling Thea that whenever a coffee file is being opened, we have an editor that provides this UI that can edit this file. And then we have the backend contribution, which is a connector that connects the editors to something called the model server. This is something we are going to discover once we have introduced two editors. The model server is responsible for synchronizing different editors. So it's going to synchronize the form-based editor with a graphical editor. And the model connector is responsible for getting the model from this model server. So this yeah, definition of a coffee machine and then um, providing it to the coffee tree editor and also writing back any data that we change. Moving on, so graphical modeling. Also have a file that makes up a diagram. So this is a graphical representation of uh, some part of the model. It shows the different activities that the water that the coffee machine might run through from pushing a button, checking the water, and so on. And in this uh, graphical editor, you can also not only show the model, but also create new notes. I could create a note chat and then maybe create a flow that would say, OK, whenever you drank a coffee, you can then afterwards chat, for instance. Uh, this is SVG based. That's why it zooms so nicely. And um, let's take a look how that was created. So involved components. This was created with a technology that's called GLSP for short, or Graphical Language Server Platform. And it is based on the idea of leveraging LSP for graphical editors. LSP is the language server protocol. If you're not familiar with that, going to have a small excursion later on of what it's about. The general idea is that you separate the client of GLSP from the server. The client is responsible for displaying the diagram and for interacting with the user. So for example, for allowing the user to use a tool to create a node or to create an edge. And this GLSP client is generic. So it does not understand your particular diagram. It just understands how to manipulate graph-based diagrams. And it's responsible for rendering a graphical visualization for that. The GLSP server, in contrast, is specific to, as I phrased it here, one DSL, so one particular type of diagram. And it understands that diagram, so it maps the coffee maker model to a graphical visualization. So it understands that, for example, on the diagram, we need a node for each activity in this model, and we need an edge for connecting the activity if there is a reference between the two. And by that separation of concerns, you can just reuse a prepackaged GLSP client component that you don't need to program yourself. The only thing you have to provide is a GLSP server. And that makes things a lot easier. And finally, of course, the server also is responsible for synchronizing with the model server again to be able to synchronize the two editors. The graphical language server platform is based on another framework for this graphical visualization, which is called Eclipse Sprotty. If we look at that from an architectural point of view, we have the Thea front and back end again. In the front end, we contribute the GLSP editor component as is. You might note the yellow border. What you need to contribute to the front end is shapes for and icons and what you want to have for your editor. But you don't need to contribute code that, for example, introduces the drag and drop action to connect to edges or something like that. That's all part of the pre-existing generic GLSP editor. Then you need to create this GLSP connector. This is a quite thin component that is only responsible for launching a GLSP server. The GLSP server is now the component that is specific to your particular model. It can make use of GLSP core for implementing that, and it's responsible for creating the graphical visualization. And finally, the GLSP server will again connect to the model server to fetch the data that it's going to display or change. 
Model server, we've talked about that a lot now already. So what is it really responsible for? Well, um, if we look at the two editors that we have open now and we just place them side by side, you are going to notice that the two visualizations have some overlap. So for example, this new chat action that I've introduced here, it's also visible within the tree structure. Um, it's within the workflow of the super brewer and it shows here. So this is the chat action. So um, what I can do is I can now change the chat action, for example, to take a nap. And if you notice, it also changes over here in the other editor because the two editors work on the same runtime state. And that's something or a feature request that's quite common in those kind of tools. You don't expect to be working on two different states and then the user must always save before they can open another editor. You, you expect the editors to just work side by side and basically edit the same runtime state. And this is really what the model server is about. So if I would go in here and change that back to chat, you can also see that now the GLSP-based diagram will snap back to the old name of the activity. Good. Back to the slides. So what is this all about? So why do we even need this uh, component in the first place? The idea of the model server is you have in the back end here on the right hand side, you have a model or a configuration file. This is some nodes that are made up of attributes and the nodes are often interconnected. And part of that model is being displayed maybe in a form based editor, part is being displayed in a graphical editor, and maybe even part is displayed in a textual editor. So in our case, the blue part is being displayed in JSON forms, the purple part is being displayed in a GLSP-based editor, and the green part would be displayed in an LSP-based editor. And all of those editors essentially are working on the same, or supposed to be working on the same runtime state. Now they could just coordinate directly with each other who is working on what and what changes there are, but obviously that does not scale. And that's why there is a component available in the EMF Cloud project called the model server. And that's now responsible for synchronizing the efforts of the different editors. Now, small excursion, what is EMF.cloud? So I mentioned that earlier, its goal is to be able to build web-based modeling tools, really with an emphasis on modeling. It's components for the clouds that cover frequent use cases. So we, for example, have this tree editor, and we have um, this model server, and it also encapsulates best practices. And furthermore, there's example modeling tools like the one that we are just using for the demonstration here, this coffee editor tool. That's also something that emf.cloud produces because it tries to provide architecture blueprints how to build those kinds of tools. And those blueprints demonstrate how emf.cloud components can be used and how you can also use other components that make sense in the context of such a tool. And finally, it's also an incubator for new web-based components. So for example, the GLSP project has been incubated within emf.cloud. Now how, because that's a frequent question, how is that different from EMF? So it is a totally independent project, technically and organizationally, but there's many similar concepts. So the components are independent of EMF with one notable exception, that's the model server. Um, and the model server can encapsulate a dependency to EMF. So you can have an EMF-based model within the model server without the editors knowing about that. That can be helpful if you migrate a tool and that facilitates reusing EMF-based models if you have any. Now to the model server features. So as I mentioned earlier, the main feature is to provide a shared runtime state of the models that are being edited in the different editors. If you're familiar with EMF, it's like a shared editing domain. So it shares a potentially dirty runtime state. With dirty, I mean that it has changes that are not persisted to disk yet. And it features a command-based change interface. So the editors can send commands to the model server what they would like to edit. And it also features notification 
mechanisms so that the editors know what other editors have updated over time. It's a Java-based server. Reusing existing modeling implementations is facilitated. And it allows convenient model access, either via a REST API um, that, uh, with a REST API that can either be serving JSON or XMI, and that is available for, or that provides different client APIs for Java, JavaScript, and I omitted TypeScript here. So clients can quite easily connect to that. So we've seen, seen the JSON forms editor. It uses a TypeScript-based client API, the GLSP, server connects with a Java-based client API to this model server. How does that look like, at least to get an overview? So usually what you do is you load or get a model. Um, you can do that with the code that we see here. So the client gets a certain file from the workspace, foo xmi here, and then waits for a, re a response. Um, this is only loaded once per session. So with that, you can also share sessions between the different editors. And then there's other methods to subscribe and react to changes and optionally also to synchronize on that changes. So um, you can subscribe and then you will get a command whenever something updates. And you can also, you would then typically update your local representation of that. And you can obviously also send change command. So a typical workflow, we can see that on the right-hand side is that an editor changes something. In this case, the blue JSON forms editor sends a change command to the model server. The model server will then apply or reject, in this case, apply the command, which will trigger some change in the model. And the other two editors will receive the command to be able to also update their editor state in the front end. OK, now moving on to other features. So we've talked about generators, model to text. So the idea is here that you create some or generate something from the model that you have. Um, so in this case, we have contributed actions, as we discussed earlier in this, in this architecture example. I've contributed actions to the context menu of the coffee file. There's even two, because I'm going to demonstrate two different code editors. So I can generate Java workflow code. Now the generator is running in the background. And once it has completed, I have a bunch of code here. Um, so for example, I have ch a chat Java class here that corresponds to the chat node that we have introduced into, into our model earlier, into this notation file here. And it has some boilerplate code that I could start coding on. And the other thing that I could generate from that is C++ code. And we'll work um, with that particular code in a minute. But that's the generator for now. The generator is one of those components where you can really reuse a lot if you already have a generator. And the generator framework that we used here is Eclipse Extend. So we had a pre-existing generator that was written with Eclipse Extend. And um, we have just built a jar with Maven. And we have wrapped or uh, written a little bit of code to be able to call the generator via CLI. So to just pass two parameters. The integration basically is we provide it with a currently active Thea workspace folder so that it knows where to generate the code to. We've seen that it generates a source and source gen folders. And secondly, we've pass, uh, passed on the model file so that it knows what to consume. Now, uh, once you've generated code, you, of course, would also like to use that source code within the tool that's working with source code. And I'll just do that right away in the demo. So I have the chat Java class here. Um, this is a fully functional code editor. You can see that there is syntax highlighting, but there's also auto-completion. So I can just let this auto-complete like you're probably used to within ADT and Eclipse or other editors. And I can also start typing stuff. Welcome to And there is other features in here that you would expect from such an editor. So for example, you could also extract this um, 
into a field, for example, right? And then call this maybe message. Yeah. The, the things that you would expect from a good IDE. And the other thing you can, of course, also do is you could also launch that. So we have this um, generator also generated a runner to be able to launch that as JUnit tests. And within that runner, there is methods to run the different uh, test classes that we have created. And what I would like to do is set a breakpoint. So before we go into run chat, which is the class that we've just edited, we're going to break. And in order to launch that, I just hit start debugging. And now we have a debugger running. We're now at the breakpoint. We have the usual actions, so we could now step into to see what that does. Okay, it creates a new chat class, prints something to the console. Now it executes the tasks. That's interesting. I'm going to dive into that. Now it goes into the pre-execute method. This is the method that we've changed for the chat Java class. So let's dive into that. And here we're in our custom code, constructing the message, and then outputting the message. By the way, this also, I mean, it has the usual things. So you can also, you have the variables here. I have the local variable here. Welcome to Cloud Tools Time 2021, for example. I could just change that on the fly. If I now continue, you can see that it just used the string that I've changed in debug mode. So everything, in my opinion, that you would expect from a state-of-the-art debugger. Now let's quickly talk about how that has been done. And let's do that excursion that I've mentioned earlier uh, about the language server protocol. So the language server protocol is an idea to separate the front end tooling for editing code from the back end language smarts. The language smarts are things like autocompletion, refactoring support that are really language dependent. So you have to understand Java to be able to run autocompletion or refactorings. But for the front end, you don't have to understand Java. You have to understand editing. You have to know, OK, when you press a certain key combination, you request an autocomplete. And uh, you need to implement scrolling, numbering the lines of code, how to add a breakpoint visually, those kinds of things. And once you separate those two things, then one team, usually the team that creates a language, is responsible for also creating the implementation for language smarts. And that's then an LSP server. And this LSP server doesn't know which tool it will run in. So it's not specific to Eclipse, Visual Studio Code, uh, you name it. It's only specific to a language. While the front end people are now responsible for creating the editor experience. And the LSP client, on the other hand, is language agnostic. So it's not bound to Java or C++ and the like. And Eclipse Thea ships with an LSP client. So as long as your language has someone that provides an LSP-enabled server, you can very simply integrate it into Eclipse Thea. And that's how it's done here. So if we work with the Java source code, we have the usual architecture again. We have an LSP-enabled editor that just chips out of the box. And in the back end now, we have a Java LSP connector. That's a component I highlighted in blue. It is pre-existing, but it's language specific now. I just wanted to make it clear which parts are language specific, especially in contrast to C++. Now, this language connector will connect to a language server. In the case of Java, it will connect to JDTLS, which is a language server that just exposes JDT via the LSP protocol. For the debug UI, the story is very similar. There's a pre-existing component in Thea that provides you with the UI. It will use a JDB DAP debug adapter protocol connector. The debug adapter protocol is this, a similar thing to LSP just for debugging. And it will then, this connector will then use a Java debug server to be able to deep instrument and debug Java code. All components here are pre-existing, not a single line of code to be written. The blue components are the ones that are language specific. The green components are the ones that are not language specific. 
and that won't change for a different language. And finally, of course, if you launch something, you'll have yet another JVM that runs your Java program that you will have to provide on your own. Now, how does that look like for C++? Um, let's just quickly explain it, and then I demonstrate it anyway. Um, the code editor is, again, exactly the same one. The difference is now that we have a C++ LSP connector, and the language server, in this case, is called ClangD. It's a language server that just exposes Clang, a very popular uh, C compiler. Um, to the LSP protocol. And for the debug UI, the story is very similar. So the blue components are now all exchanged in comparison to the Java case. But, and, but all the components that we see here in blue are still pre-existing. So nothing to program there either. Now in the demo, let's go back to the C++ code, because there was also C++ code um, generated. And I'm not a C programmer, so forgive me for any weird mistakes I'm going to make here. Um, so first of all, I would like to introduce, so we have this chat class here. Um, this looks very similar to the Java case. And in the chat class, we have this pre and post execute methods. And then, where is it? I'm looking for the header file because I would like to introduce yet another variable to the chat class, the variable for being able to uh, store the message. So that's something in the STD library, a string message. And I can already pre-initialize that to welcome to ECDT. And when we go to chat CPP, we can now implement pre-execute, similar to what we've done before. So a little bit of auto-completion here, and we're going to pass in this dot message. So that's our message. And as I learned, in order to get an end line, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> well, hopefully, this code now works. Uh, let's set the breakpoint here again, as we've done before. Let's launch the debugger again. We have it here. It's a debug configuration for C++. Let's launch it. Ah, I've missed the breakpoint, right? Yeah. But we should have the message out here as well. So basically, it allows you to do the same things. I've just missed the breakpoint. You can also edit local variables. Uh, the one that we had, yeah, we're finished already, but we would have the message here, and we can also change it. And basically, the whole UI is exactly the same, just the, the programming language is different, and the underlying LSP server is different. Now, on to textual modeling. Um, for textual modeling, we also have some files that make up a textual model here. This is this configuration file. This is a DSL that's about assigning probabilities to the different edges. You can also say how much a probability is, what is a high probability, and it will give you some feedback like, okay, this doesn't make sense. A value of a probability must be between 1 and 0, uh, is between 0 and 1. So I'll, I'll revert that back and then it also allows you to make some assertions um, that better skipping also for time reasons. Um, 
And what I really wonder is why I, how did I mess up the syntax highlighting? Okay, I don't know. Usually you would get auto completions for the different actions that you can invoke. Um, for example, chat would be one of the actions that we can have here. So that is yet another editor integrated with the model server that pulls the same information. The text editing is um, the Thea editor again. So the Thea code editor that we've just seen because Xtext, which is the framework that we created the grammar for this um, textual DSL by is um, able to create an LSP based server. So you can just generate that again. And uh, for the integration, we've used the Java-based model server API. So in the architecture, we have this LSP-enabled editor that ships with Thea again. We have an LSP connector that's now responsible for launching our LSP. And our specific LSP for this config files is now an Xtext-based LSP server. And this is generated except for the for a little piece. The little piece is providing the available tasks so remember chat, brew, and so on to the LSP server for auto-completion. And this task provider needs to coordinate with the model server to do so, so it pulls in the available tasks from the model server. In this case, it's read-only, no stuff being written back. For the analysis, we also have a brief demo. Um, So this will bring up a pretty nice visualization that shows the different execution paths that are available. So you need, always need to push the button and check the water, but then you have two possibilities. Either you need to refill or the water is okay, and then you continue with the path. That is not something we've obviously programmed. That is something where uh, for a change, you can just use a non-Eclipse framework for once, and that's D3. That's a very rich visualization library. And that allow, basically gives you this visualization, visualization almost for free. The only thing you need to write is a piece of code that displays the results from D3. So embeds an HTML page in this view. And then there's an analysis connector that connects to a service. This service will pull data from the model server and run an analysis, basically assigning the probabilities to those actions to come up with that graph. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, what if you don't do it greenfield, if you already have a pre-existing tool. The message that I really would like to deliver to you, because I've seen a lot of projects struggle with a different strategy, is if you migrate an existing tool, don't do a big bang migration where you create a new tool side by side with the existing tool. Really try to do it iterative. And it sounds a little bit weird and difficult, but it can really work. Um, and the strategy behind that is um, you, maybe you only decide to do a migration and you don't do the actual creation of the web-based tool yet. But knowing that you will do a migration in the future will help you to already consider this as a fact for architectural decisions. So for example, if you then introduce a new analysis view, you might look into JavaScript-based frameworks like D3 that are able to deliver that because then you know that later on you can still use that component in a web-based context. On the midterm, you might be more proactive and prepare your architecture for a migration in an iterative fashion. So introduce components that are capable to also run in the web, um, Try to separate your business logic from the UI because you know that you will have to re-implement large parts of the UI, but you can reuse your business logic. And then you can start to migrate high value use cases iteratively. So for example, you could introduce um, an, analysis, an analysis component and only that component is available in a web-based fashion. But, and that's the most important thing, this component is, from a code perspective, exactly the same component that's being used in your legacy desktop-based tool, so that you don't have the additional maintenance effort that otherwise will just kill you over time. Long-term, at some point, you migrate all the use cases and you can deprecate then the desktop-based solution. But the core takeaway really is you do it iteratively, component by component, and you retrofit the components that you create into your legacy tool so that you can share the code based in something that I would call single sourcing. So in summary, 
you can build web-based tools quite easily today. It's really feasible. Um, a lot of the frameworks allow for reusing components, especially components that are not UI bound. So business logic that you've created. And if you want to get a head start with that, you can take a look at the blueprints that are available as part of the emf.cloud project. They're available on GitHub. You can either build them yourself or you can try the live uh, demo that is also available on the link that I posted before. There's another example, an eCore editor in the emf.cloud project, so that might also be interesting. And what I would really suggest to you is, even if it seems like a web-based tool for you might be far out in the future, it's important to define a strategy now, even if the strategy is say, okay, I will migrate in five years from now. But if your teams already know that now, they can make other architectural decisions that won't make it as painful in the future as it could be. And what's also what I also find quite helpful, just build a proof of concept. I mean, you don't have to migrate it right away but there is certainly some uh, very important aspects in your tool that you could try to build in a web-based fashion to see where the technology is there and what uh, pain points could be. And with that, I'd like to pass back to you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can still post them there. And I don't know if any questions already arose that you collected, Brian. Yeah. Yes. Um... Thank you for an excellent presentation, uh, Maximilian. Just a reminder to everybody in the audience, uh, we have time for one or two questions. So please get them in in the Ask a Question tab at the bottom there. Um, one has come in from, from Sergei. I guess it's related to resources. You know, uh, you know, in your examples, you pulled in a lot of components. And how does that scale in terms of you know, CPU and memory usage and, and such? Mm -hmm. So in a web based um, application. Yeah, so if you deploy that in a cloud-based fashion and you deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster, that's probably the scenario we would look at. Um, it is quite, depending on the tool, of course, but the full tool that we've seen now where you can do code editing with Java and C++, basically a lot of the things that run there are computationally heavy. If you think about the compiler, for example, the compiling for a big project might take a lot of CPU time. So it is also clear that when you move to that scenario and you have a user that currently uses compilation, for example, for a large project, it's going to be to use a lot of resources on this Kubernetes cluster for the time that it's being used. So um, if you have users that work 24 seven on that, they are going to um, only few users you can put on the same node of a Kubernetes cluster with a medium sized node. It's obviously ranges a lot depending on the size and so on. But the idea, if you have something like full blown IDE tooling that you can put hundreds of users on the same node, that's not the case, right? On the other hand, the front end users, they don't need machines that are very capable, right? They can, they don't have a lot of computation to do in the front end. Hope that answers your question to some extent. Yeah, thank you. So hot off the presses, Mark Hoffman asks, for an iterative migration, can you integrate existing or CP with already migrated web UIs? Existing RCP, is that? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> So existing RCP UI components, difficult. Right? You can use wrap to do that. My experience is that it just doesn't look good mostly. It's very difficult to get the same kind of styling and it doesn't really evolve your architecture either. It, I would consider it to be maybe a bridge technology to say, okay, I have this piece of UI and I don't really have the time to rebuild that now with web-based technology. I will use something like wrap to add it to this web-based UI. Um, so UI difficult, business logic often surprisingly simple, right? Um, we've seen different cases, the, the generator 
Uh, the entire model for the coffee maker was the same one that we already had for an RCP-based application, including the validation rules. Um, and so a lot of, or if you think about the JSON forms-based editors that could be leveraged or uh, the X-text-based grammar. So all the business logic related stuff, yes. UI stuff, quite difficult. Um, and what I mean by this iterative approach is really to, you, if you have an existing RCP-based application, you would piece by piece replace an RCP SWT-based UI with a HTML5-based UI that you retrofit in a browser widget into the RCP application. That would be a way forward to be able to you know, share the same code base until you're ready for the web-based tool. OK. Um, so I'll ask you to be like super, super brief on this one, Maximilian, because we're, 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 we'll overflow into a, another webinar. But the, the last question is um, just two parts. Um, maybe we'll just answer one of them. In your opinion, what level of effort would be required to realize a solution based on this stack for a web-based MBSE? model-based systems engineering tool <laughs> with support, for example, for SysML diagrams. <laughs> if you can answer that for 30 seconds, you're a better person than I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a really hard question because that really depends on the extent yeah, yeah. you need to be able to support that. But so quite recently, yeah. we have developed a a SysML diagram for components that can be nested and that also contain functions. Uh, that is something in the order of tens of uh, person days to develop that. So between 30 and 50 days to create this GLSP based editors, including the setup of a, a Thea based application and, um, and the model server for that. But every additional diagram will be more work. And if you have other editors, obviously it will be more work. So yeah depends on the features, that would be a starting point. Fantastic. Um, thank you for, to everybody for coming. Before you go, I just have um, a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, thank you again, Maximilian, for the presentation. I hope to see you again, again here. So um, the next Cloud Tool Time, it's on July 27th. And we're going to have Jordan Balov. I was going to talk about low-code development with Eclipse Dirigible. Um, all the links are going to be posted in the chat for what I'm just announcing. Um, we're also looking to book more Cloud Tool to Tool Time webinars. So, if you're interested in presenting one or if you have an idea, please fill out our form. Um, and finally, we would love to hear your feedback on this session. So it would just take one minute of your time. A green button is going to appear down the bottom. Uh, even if um, the recording goes off, uh, that green button will still be there. You can click on it at any time. Um, so that's it. Um, if you want to be part of our community moving forward, I encourage you to go to ecdtools.eclipse.org slash community. You can find out where to reach us to ask more questions um, and to hopefully bring you into my contributions to our community. So thank you again for coming and hope to see you at the next Cloud Tool Time. Goodbye. <laughs>